So before I start, uh, just some housekeeping things. I had sent out an e uh, a Slack message yesterday that for a piece of this, we will need Docker. So either you should have Docker installed or be sitting next to one who has Docker installed. So talk to your neighbors. This is a good way to know them as well. Uh, and make sure that you have at least one person in a sequence of three with Docker installed. And if you are running Windows, Chris is your guy. <laughs> All right, so I, I tried this very hard this morning, this mind trick that uh, Chris posted. And I thought that you would all know everything I'm going to talk about by the time we got here. But it didn't quite work out. So I'm going to spend about 15 minutes talking a little bit about this idea of re-executable pipelines and what the different pieces entail. Do you need to pull an image? Not right now. OK, but they will all start it. Yeah, it's a small image. Yeah. Uh, we're going to kind of talk about why we try to think about re-executable pipelines and then get hands-on very soon after that. So most of us are quite familiar with the data flow in brain imaging. It goes from subjects, your experiments, your analysis, your derived data to publications. Unfortunately, we mostly get to see this part. Most of the other pieces are kind of lost on us. But the problem is that variance in that last bit comes from all of those other pieces that we don't often pay attention to. So I use this as an example. This is a, a paper that kind of looked at centers for differences between people who stutter and people who don't. These are white matter differences. And I think you'll all agree with me that it's everywhere. The, uh, yet, the published literature tends to focus on a particular area of the brain whenever they write about these things, saying that a particular area of the brain is where these differences occur. But we don't understand all the details of what these sources of variance are. We often attribute it to participants. But it turns out there are sources of variance in various places. So for example, if you're doing imaging analysis, the way the error is modeled across three prominent software, SPM, F AFNI, and FSL, are different. And that will also contribute to differences in your analysis. So even if you were saying, I'm doing the same exact model across things, just underlying implementation details as to how things are modeled create differences between these software. Uh, Josh Karp, and you've seen this image several times now over this week, and it's kind of important. He took a single data set and analyzed it with a bunch of different workflows, all with re reasonable sets of parameters. And then he extracted the peak coordinates of the blobs that showed up as a result of a statistical analysis. And what's shown here is the distribution of those peak coordinates as a function of uh, uh, spatial location. and. Uh, one can easily see that there is a point spread function that's not captured directly by a sing any single coordinate. More recently, uh, Tristan's group looked at a very simple thing, which is running FSL on multiple CentOS operating systems. And what's shown over here is the relation between subcortical volumes extracted by running the same piece of software on two different operating systems. Now, these are dice coefficient maps. For those of you who don't know what dice coefficient is, it's a m measure of similarity, uh, how similar to volumes in this case are. And ideally, we would like this map to just be one everywhere. But it's not. There's a lot of variance across these structures. And this is not a function of different software. It's a function of a different operating system. More recently, we've repeated this across Mac OS X and a Docker container. And we see similar variation, uh, in some cases, up to about 10% variation in these structural volumes. Again, not a function directly of the software being used, but of interaction between software and operating system. Finally, uh, on the left, uh, this is kind of what my pre-processing workflow looked like about 17 years back. On the right is what it looks like, roughly speaking, right now. So, and these are just pieces of something called fMRI prep, which uh, I will briefly touch on. This is not even the complete workflow. And the reason for the comple increased complexity is to be robust to different variations in data sets. 
Uh, we often focus on workflows that are specific to our data sets. But this also brings about the notion that this, with this complexity comes interactions with your operating system and your hardware environments. And all of those things introduce variability. So variance is everywhere. So how do we reduce that variance or understand that variance or explain that variance? And one way to think about it is through this idea of a reproducibility spectrum. That we can think about things as, can we repeat an analysis? Can somebody else replicate an analysis? How generalizable is our analysis? And something in this open source and data science world that we think about are how easy it is for other people to reuse components of your analysis. So going back to this data flow, there are many places and pieces of variance. And one of the things that I want to focus on over the next few slides is this idea that you want to not just publish a paper, but you want to publish your data, your environment, and your code. And we'll hopefully end up today's session with some of the tools of the trade be, of being able to do so. So first thing, version your code. I'm assuming, given boot camp on day one, all of you know what GitHub is. Uh, and all of you are using GitHub, or Git, at least, to version your code. Second thing, also given Chris's session on day one, I'm assuming that many of you are hopefully writing tests as you write code. Now, it's a learning process. It doesn't happen overnight. But that's also kind of important. And there are pieces in place to start doing this. This is what we'll talk about a little bit today, versioning your data. Uh, that hasn't kind of come up in the context uh, of the boot camp sessions, and we'll talk a little bit. That's going to be your hands-on exercise. And the reason you want to think about DataLad as a tool for versioning is partly because you have access to about 10 terabytes of data freely through DataLad. This is the public collection of data that's available. And this is not talking about many of these other data sets like ADNI, HCP, ABCD, or the UK Biobank, which come from sort of restricted access sources. You can get access to them, but you need to go through some authorization. With DataLad, those 10 terabytes are directly downloadable onto your system. And we'll take a look at that. Versioning your environment. Uh, you, since I mentioned that we will be using Docker as a hands-on thing, that's kind of a precursor to using Docker as a way to describe and maintain your environment. There are a bunch of other things out there which we won't talk about. So there's general purpose virtual machines. Uh, there are other types of HPC containers called Singularity. And if you haven't heard of Singularity, you should come talk to me at some point, uh, because it's really useful in HPC environments where your system administrator won't install Docker. Um, we will be using this. Yes? Just a question. When, you, when you're comparing the OSs and the differences, does Docker protect you from that? So in a Docker image, is it entirely consistent, or is there still influence of the Android? So a Docker is entirely consistent, but that doesn't protect you from the variance that's in, inherent in the algorithm. So what really needs to happen is better testing for algorithms across different platforms and numerical edge cases. And that's often not done in imaging software. So Docker will reduce the variability, but I think that's a bad way of reducing variability. So NeuroDocker is a, a tool that sits on top of Docker to allow you to create neuroimaging environments, and we'll go through a little bit of that. We also recommend that you create and use open software to enable this kind of re-executability. If you have a black box software somewhere that's hard to get access to, it's going to be more difficult to make something re-executable. Um, and there is a whole host of tools out there now that I think solves almost every problem anybody in neuroimaging runs into. And if it's not there, there's probably somebody working on it. Uh, so in the Post-break session, we'll be looking at NiPipe, and that's a way of prescribing a workflow or a data flow. And the general idea behind NiPipe is to abstract away some of the things that uh, allow you to connect pieces of data without thinking about data management, per se. And that's the general space of data flows. Uh, and there are many, many engines out there for various data flow programming. In fact, there's a page by 
uh, it's called Awesome Pipelines, and we'll put a link to it. There's about 140 pipeline engines out there and growing on a daily basis. Uh, one of the reasons we like using NiPipe for various things is, at least in the neuroimaging space, it wraps around many existing tools that are common in the neuroimaging world. And several tools have been built on top of NiPipe. So we have CPAC and Mindboggle, and more recently, MRIQC and FMRI Prep, which are also BITS compatible um, applications. And these are tools that allow you to or abstract away from having to construct pipelines directly in Python, but be able to use these complex and robust pipelines through a simpler interface. Finally, once you got, get through the analysis, where do you push all of these things? So the Open Science Framework is a fantastic resource to publish things to. So yes, you can put your code on GitHub, but where do you put your data? We've put up to 200 gigs of data on Open Science without them blinking an eye. And so there's, till they come to us and say we can't put data out there, that's actually a really nice place to put data. Then there are places like Zenodo where you can also put data. But Zenodo, if you go beyond 50 gigs, you have to talk to them and get permission. So Open OSF was the only place where we could dump 200 gigabytes without thinking about it. Then there are platforms like Open Neuro that uh, Chris and Russ have been building. This is uh, almost a Yoda-like uh, picture of Chris from a while back. Um, and that's another place to share your data. So if you can make your data publicly available, uh, I would highly recommend putting it over there and sharing it. And then once you get through the data bits uh, and you want to publish your stats, there's NeuroVault. And you can put images into NeuroVault. And this is also pioneered by Chris and others. And uh, it's a great way to share your statistical maps in interactive ways rather than the static 2D images that you get in a paper. Finally, we want to think about the spectrum of reproducibility a little bit more. Um, the idea typically for re-executability is that you can repeat your analysis. But we really want to f push it further and think about how you can e abstract pieces of your pipelines so that you can replace things. This is where things like NiPipe come in. You can take out an FSL component and put in an SPM component. Um, you may want to point it at a different set of data rather than your original data. So you want an abstraction on the data. And that's really what we, where we want to get to, the generalizability point about science. Now, as, uh, uh, since I borrowed this from Dave, uh, as he talks about this word similar, similar has a lot of wiggle room in science. And we can, we'll need to go over beers and other forms of alcohol to talk about the various concepts of similarity. But it's important to think about. When you say two papers showed the same result, what did you really mean by that? And we often mean very different things when we see that. Uh, the precision of what similarity is varies. Uh, just as I showed early on, people say the differences between people who stutter and people who don't are in, pre are, are in the white matter underlying premotor cortex, ventral premotor cortex. Now, if you remember those dots from that figure, those are all over the brain, not just ventral premotor cortex. But that's. If you look across the literature, despite those dots, that's the, word, that's the area of the brain that comes out. So we are often biased by what we are looking for rather than what the data shows. So when we want to think about similarity, we have to think about not just the result similarity, we have to think about the data that went in, the environment that was used, and the analysis codes. OK, so we will look at each of these pieces in turn, data, environment, and code. So at this point in time, I would ask you to log in to your Jupyter Hub instance. And if you run into trouble logging in, please post on the Slack channel. I think Chris is here somewhere. The other Chris.
Is it just the primary URL fine? Or? Okay. So perhaps you can raise your hand if you're not yet seeing this page. Right. Everybody on the page? Is there anybody who's not there yet? OK. That's great. All right, so we'll click on repos. So I'm going to circle repos. And then inside, we'll click on reproducible imaging. And let's click on index uh, and then open the index file. And as you guys are probably familiar right now, we'll just play this cell. So shift enter. And it'll give us the three notebooks that we'll be looking at a little bit. So I'm going to now uh, do the following, which is on one side of my screen, I will have the notebook. And I will also open a terminal, which this is an old terminal. Let me just go back here, new terminal. So let me walk you through. So you had this page where you opened index.ipynb. If you look over to the right, there's a new uh, button. We'll click on new and hit select terminal. And within the terminal, we'll type the word bash, B-A-S-H. I don't know if I can make this larger. We'll see. Yeah, OK. OK. And you should have a session with your name on it as opposed to my name, uh, because JupyterHub creates sessions for everyone. So far, so good. Everybody. Uh, please raise your hand uh, if you are left behind or not following. Right? So we want to make sure that the different steps are followed. Uh, there will be a set of exercises that come up which will give, us, give people time to catch up on things. Okay, so the first one we'll, we'll click into is this uh, notebook on versioned data. And as I mentioned, we are going to cover data lad. Uh, most of this notebook is set up that you don't have to touch the terminal at all. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to bring up the terminal is that in Jupyter, you get full access to the shell. And that's actually a nice thing in many ways of installing new software, debugging things. Uh, so it's good to have it there. And we can check on the terminal that you can do things. The notebook is constructed so that we execute shell environments. There's not a line of Python in this notebook. So this also shows you that you can use Jupyter Hub to do other things other than Python. I think, yes, there is a strong connection between Python and Jupyter, but it can actually be used for a lot of things. Okay. So we'll walk through a few things. And uh, the first thing we're going to do is, so this program is called DataLad. I'm not going to go into how things are installed. Uh, they have documentation to do that. But here we're going to focus on how we can use it to do various things. So we can execute this first shell, which will give us help. In fact, let's do the following before we do anything. We'll click on cell. We'll go down to all output. And we'll hit clear. OK. That just cleared everything. Um, now, you could play it back and fill everything up at a later time if you wanted to. But it helps us to kind of walk through these different places. 
So the first thing with any command, so data lad is a shell command, uh, we will ask for help. And so we will execute this first shell and take a look at the output. So data lad does a lot of things. Uh, it can allow you to fetch data, it can allow you to version your own data, uh, and it's really useful to think about DataLad as a tool almost like Git for data. Okay. So all of you are familiar with Git now. You can version your code, it allows you to do things. DataLad is built on a tool that extends Git called Git Annex. We're not going to go into details of Git Annex, we'll use a few Git Annex commands uh, later on in the notebook. But let's start by seeing what else can we do with DataLad. Well, it says we can create things, we can install things, we can get things. Uh, how do we get more help on it? So that's your first uh, exercise. How do you generate help for the install command for DataLad? And you can do it in two places. You can do it in the terminal, you can do it in the notebook itself. Note that in that first no first cell that we executed, there was a, a, an exclamation mark at, in the front. And what that does is it tells Jupyter, please execute this in the shell that you're running in. So I'm looking at things in the terminal. Data lad help or data lad dash dash help by itself tells me all the things data lad can do. Uh, I'm not going to go into things, but if I wanted to know how to install a data set, then the command line for it shows up with data lad install dash dash help. So this is just getting access to help. It's mostly to orient you that if you need help on certain things, you can always come back to this and get help on different commands that you're using. So let's move on. So the first thing we'll do is install a data set. And so to do that, we will execute this shell command. And you can notice that I'm now executing it in a slightly different way. It has this person person bash at the beginning. In Jupyter world, that's called a magic, and this is a bash magic, and it allows you to execute bash commands straight within the notebook cell. Okay. So we are changing our directory to slash data, and we are executing this command called data lad install slash slash slash. And that should be fairly quick to execute. You should be able to find it. So what did that do? It basically fetched the top level metadata from all the data sets that are available in DataLad. And we can look at it. So there is a shell command called tree. And what we're going to do is have you execute that shell command in the next cell. So you can always hit show solution to get hints or the answer to how to do that but this is trying to get your Unix shell foo up a, a few notches.
So again, I'm, I'm showing it in the terminal window where I ran the command. Uh, we can see that uh, I'm using the dash L flag. So for almost anything on the Unix shell, you can ask for help on that command, right? So the same way we ask for help on data lad, you can ask for help on tree. Uh, there's a whole host of tools that are available on the Unix platform that help you to do things. And so tree is one of those things that's kind of nice to inspect directory structures in a Unix shell. So tree space dash L three gives me up to three levels. It's just that in this case, there's only one level. I'm pointing it to slash data slash datasets dot data lad dot org. Uh, and the reason is data lad didn't download the 10 terabytes of data when we asked it to install the data set. It only downloaded the metadata at the of the top level packages. Okay. So now let's think about how do we search for things. So your next command search is what does the search command do? Can you figure out or how to invoke the search command? Yes. Right, so it's one of two things. If you have a single line command, you can prefix it with that exclamation mark and it'll be a single thing. But if you have a multi line command, then you can use the person percent bash. And my question is, you have to use it? Yes, yeah. So every cell is unique and you have to, uh, to do that for. Because we are running, we are officially running the Python kernel. So the only thing that that code cell directly knows and can execute is Python code. But as I said, since we won't be writing even a line of Python in this first piece, uh, we're going to focus on bash commands or shell commands. And I'm just going along on the terminal side of things, uh, but you should be able to see the exact same thing as the output on the cell side. Now, one of the things that's important to keep in mind one flag for this command is the dash D flag. So we're, if we went to a, within a data set directory. So in this case, we downloaded something into datasets.datalad.org, right? That's the folder that it created when we hit install. If we are inside that directory, datalad knows it's inside a datalad directory and can do things. But if you're not inside it, then you can give this dash D flag to point to the path of the data set. So you could be located somewhere else and you can point to that path and it will give you a, information about it. Okay, so let's do a search, and that I'll do back in the terminal. Okay, so if we execute the search, it tells us that at least in the metadata of these data sets, there are one, two, three, four, five, six data sets associated with uh, the word Haxby. So now I want you to search for Chris's. <laughs> Find data sets associated with Gorgolivsky. And just to make things easier, I put his last name there. <laughs>
Okay, so there are five data sets associated with Chris. <laughs> uh, some of them come from OpenFMRI. Some of them are things that we've cloned from OpenFMRI to make it available for other data sets. And that's one of the nice things about DataLad. When these data sets are installed, they're kind of pointers to data in the cloud. So when I create a new data set, it's not really creating another copy of the data set. It can still point to the same location where you're getting data from. So is that the workshop and I do the 17 question clone or a fork? It's, uh, it's a hybrid. Uh, so I, we will be playing with it a little more, but the actual data, the raw data, are clones, so it doesn't duplicate the data. It still points to the DS000114 data on open neuros bucket. So it doesn't duplicate data unless you force it to. Uh, the way data lad works is by pointing to things. So that's why we're doing this. We haven't actually downloaded even a single byte of data so far. Uh, we're just looking at things, searching for things. And the next command that we will run, which says install, will also not download much data. It will only install the metadata structure for that data set. And that's something important to keep in mind. We could give a command which installs and downloads and stores everything. And we'll get to that bit in a second. But the reason we are staging it this way is to show that you can use DataLad to look at certain things without downloading everything. Uh, and in the Later on down, we can see how that can be useful. For example, if you're only interested in the T1 data from participants, you can just download the T1 data from people rather than everything from every participant. So that's really a nice way of uh, isolating pieces that you need. And you can push that data set that you've created up to GitHub. Uh, so because this is just a Git repo, you can push, it won't actually push data to GitHub, but because these things live on the web, anybody else can then clone that and install the data from their web locations. So for public data, this works. For private data, this won't work unless you have access to those things. But data lab allows authorization. HCP is not encoded yet, but imagine HCP where you need an S3 key to get access to the data. As long as you have the S3 key, you can set up DataLad to authorize it, and it will download it from that location. Uh, all the things we'll cover today are without authorization, uh, because it wasn't guaranteed that everybody would have authorization for things. But these are all public data sets that we'll be looking at. OK, so let's execute the next shell. So you can see that this is installing a particular data set that we searched through the previous command, which said the DS000114 that was recently used at, a, at an NIH workshop. So the metadata says it has uh, the information or the data available from multiple locations. And that's also another nice aspect of DataLad, is that you may have the same data replicated in multiple servers, and it will try them to get at it. Uh, it's not completely intelligent. It won't, for example, choose the closest server to you at this point in time. Uh, but that's in the route map at some point in time. OK, so now that you're familiar with tree, let's see what we downloaded.
So if you look at the output of the tree command, you'll notice that this is a full-fledged bids data set together with derivatives. But we don't really have the derivatives in there. We're looking at three levels over here. Uh, so it's not going to go beyond a few levels. Uh, but you could ask for five levels, for example. And we still don't have anything under fMRI prep or FreeSurfer. So we'll go back to three levels uh, to talk about a few things. You can also see that this data set has a dwi.bval and bvec at the root level. And it has this cryptic pointer to a .git directory. Right? And that's the crux of datalad and git annex. So imagine uh, you are storing data that belongs to, that's the same data, same file, that is pointed to by different locations. You don't want to make copies of that file unless absolutely necessary or you're modifying it. So what they do is, in Git, if you had done this straight up with Git, right, you would store a file in Git, and it would be stored in two places. It would be stored on your file system, on your directory, and in the .git directory, because Git would make a copy of it and store it, in case you wanted to return back to it after you deleted or made changes to the file. So there would be two copies of the file. And that would explode depending on what kind of data you're storing. It's kind of unnecessary to store two copies of the file. So the way Datalad works is that file is only stored in the .git directory, and this arrow that tree shows is a sim link or a symbolic link to that file. Okay. But if we actually were to look at the contents of that file, which is the next cell, we will find And it says no such file or directory. And that's because Datalad didn't actually download the file when we said install. It downloaded the metadata from it. So how do we get it? It's very simple. We use the get command, which is the next line. And if that works for you, it should say get OK. And now we can look at the contents of this file. And sure enough, there are B values available in this file. And if we do an LS, listing the data set that we just downloaded, we get a few things which says there's a version attached to this data set. So that's how when you share data, you can get to a very specific version of the data even if you are changing this data set. Question. Yes? Can you um, speak a bit about where, just give me a bit of context about like where this Jupyter notebook is living? Ah. How it's doing all these things? Uh, yeah. Okay. It's not like, you know, it's not my local machine. I just want to know like, sure. where this is. Uh, so there are a few pieces here. We're running a Docker container through something called Jupyter Hub. And I think Chris was going to hold a session at some point in time about Jupyter Hub. And Jupyter Hub essentially spawns this same Docker container for every one of you who've, who's connected to it. Right? So each of you have your own virtual machine, so to say, in the cloud. Okay. Right? Uh, so you can download this container. It's just a 10 gigabyte download. I didn't want, we've had far more experience with getting people to download 10 plus gigabyte containers in a workshop setting, and that didn't go too well. So there is a Docker that's virtually running on the cloud that I'm plugged into, and everybody else is plugged into it. Correct. All different instances of the same virtual. Right. Okay. And then um, inside of that, we are running Jupyter. Right. And then we have a link to Datalad. Or so, so the Datalad is a software that installed in that container. So if I were to use Datalad, I have to install Datalad onto my system. Correct. And run it through my Jupyter Hub. Correct. Uh, you don't have to run it through Jupyter Hub. Uh, I mean. 
part of the reason of doing this was to have a common interface through which people did things without having to re-download. We could download Datalad onto every single computer without Jupyter, without Jupyter Hub, and you'd be able to execute these commands through the shell. Through the shell. Just to be more specific, if you do pip install Datalad, it will. So there's one piece that th that's complicated. So Datalad requires Git Annex, and Git Annex is not a Python program. So you would have to, depending on your machine, download Git Annex, uh, and that can be part of the reason of doing this. Was for certain machines it's easier, for certain machines it's harder to do that. What I would recommend is just installing Docker and running Datalad through Docker, because then it'll have all the pieces that are there. And you can create. And we'll go into how to create Docker images right after this. So that should also tell you how you can create your own local Docker image with Datalad installed to be able to do these things. So we'll get to that in a second. Uh, was there another question? No. Okay. All right, so uh, we look at it, it's a version set of data. Since Datalad, as I just said, uses git annex under the hood, we can try to list things. Uh-oh. Uh, git annex requires a location, uh, so it can't, you can't just point it to a directory and do things. Maybe in a few future version this will change, but the way to do it right now is to cd into that directory and run the command. Correct. So I wanted to point out a difference between Git Annex and Datalad over here. So Git Annex works on a single Git repo. Datalad can aggregate across multiple Git repos. So that's how we have access to all these data sets. Each data set in there is a separate Git repo. In fact, within this data set that we are downloading, the derivatives are even separate Git repos, and that's one of the reasons we ha still haven't received the derivatives. We just saw the outer structure of the main data set. Uh, so what the list command does is tells you where each file is. So, Oh, so ls is the short for list in the datalad context. This is git annex list command. Uh, and ls in the datalad context gives you the version of the file. ls uh, list in the git annex context tells you where the content of this fi these files or folders are located. And it tells us we don't have access to anything. The content is in two places. The x's mark where things are. And it says uh, that t the first t1w.ni.gz is available both on the web and in Datalad archives. Oh. It's a table. Uh, so let me parse this a little bit. So each column in that initial part is a different source for things. Here means that the data are available locally on the file system. Origin is wherever the Git repo's origin points to. Web is it's available somewhere on the web. Uh, BitTorrent is if you have the file available through BitTorrent somewhere. And Datalad Archives is a special archive where only a subset of data is maintained by Yarek at Dartmouth. Uh, so it doesn't actually archive all the data separately. So open fMRI data, for example, mostly exists in the S3 bucket. There are a few copies that are made in the Datalad Archive. Okay, so this shows us this. So we're going to, the next exercise is to use the exact same command and remember to cd to the right directory. Uh, so it, you should be able to copy and paste and ask on the DWI star files at the top level of that data set.
So it should be mostly a copy and paste from that previous cell. I, the only thing you're pointing to are the DWI files rather than subject 01. But let's take a look at those two DWI files. As you can see, one of them has an X for the column here, and one of them doesn't. And that's because we downloaded only one of those files. We got it, but we didn't get the other one. Right. And just like we can get files, we can drop files. So the next step is we're going to drop that file we received. And it sh if you execute it, it'll say, drop OK. So let's list those DWI files again. And now you can see those, the Xs are gone, right? Because we have removed both of those files. OK, and now let's get both of the files. So we go into that data set and do datalad get DWI star. Now that we know how to copy and paste everything, we are going to go back and re-execute this command. And sure enough, both of those files are there. Yes? To run? Did you do the CD, the change directory? Um, so, so the git annex in it would have been l let me take a step back are you using the same formulation where you're using person person bash with cd and git annex list <laughs> right so Jupyter doesn't remember shell history between cells. there is a comment then this doesn't work because that percentage sign percentage sign bash needs to be the first thing in the cell uh, so when if we remove this it works go team awesome thanks Chris uh, and the reason that partly happens is because that comment is interpreted as a Python comment and it thinks it's running Python and suddenly realizes that person person bash is not really anything in Python. Okay, okay so we've received those files. So now we'll do something practical with a toy data set. We'll create our own data set. And the way to do that is to use the data lad create command and we'll call it my data set. And so it created a git annex repo uh, in slash data slash my data set. We're going to create an amazing file into inside this directory, which will, yes? When we create uh, a data set now in that repo, we're all creating separate data sets. Right. So we all have a separate version of slash data. Yes. Yeah, so that's the magic of Jupyter Hub. Yeah, it's literally like running your own container on your own machine, 
right? That container won't be connected to somebody else running that container. That's exactly how this is operating. Okay, so we're going to execute the next slot, next cell, uh, which is just creating a very simple file. And notice the data lad add command. It's like git add. You're adding the file to this data set with a message. So I'm saying this is an initial file. Please add this file called 123, which just stores the string 123 into it. And we can now go and do the same thing that we were doing. Yes? Yes, uh, we will actually get to git log in a second. Um, but yes, so this is, I mean, I would still encourage you to go and learn about Git and Git Annex. This is kind of showing the practical steps of how you could use Datalad to do some of these things. But you should really think about how Git works and Git Annex works uh, to understand the mechanics behind this. So now when I list it, it says the only place this file is available is here, right? Because we just created it. It's not available on the web somewhere. Um, we can look at this tree uh, command on this data set that we've created. And as before, there's a link. So Git doesn't store the content in the file itself. It creates a symbolic, or data that doesn't store it. It creates a symbolic link into a Git repo, a Git annex uh, content. So the content is actually stored in this crazy looking file, uh, which you did not get that? I thought that it's about here. It's, like, it says data slash my data set. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so if you look at that crazy name, uh, what it is really is an MD5 checksum of the content of the file. And that's how Datalad, if let's say you have multiple copies of the file in your repo, they will all ha have the same MD5 sum. So it keeps only one of those copies when you have these things. Okay. So we've, we've looked at this. So there's, a, there's an object there. We can cat it. Uh, it says it's one, two, three, because that's what we stored into the file. Um, now let's try to drop it. And data lad says error. Why do you think it says error? Why won't it allow you to drop it? You don't have it somewhere else. You don't have it somewhere else, right? So you can force it to drop it. So there is a force option on that drop command. But by default, it's trying to protect you from accidentally erasing something that's there. Okay. All right, so we have a file. It's useful. Uh, let's try modifying this file. Oops, uh, permission denied. <laughs> It also won't allow you to modify the file by default. And the way to change that is to unlock the file, modify it, and then add it back in. So if you don't add it back in, it's just another file on your file system which has, isn't in that repo, and the Git repo hasn't been changed. So let's do that. We've added a modified file. Now we'll try to write to it again. And it will again say permission denied because we've added it and it's locked it. Right? So to make changes to the file, you have to unlock, make changes, lock. So this is for my file that I created. Correct. Is there a way to give access to other people to make changes? Or is it just that if you have access to the file, you can make changes to it? Ah, so, uh, so this is local. You've made changes. If you push this data somewhere, right, and the other person has access to the location of the data. So a common thing in a HPC cluster would be to push it, and it's a local file path. So if as long as that person has access to that path, would be able to do things. Uh, but think of what happens when you do that with just software. Uh, you make forks and clones of things 
rather than making change to the direct things. And you don't go through the normal process of merging contributions from different people. Data should be no different from that perspective. Right. So, and you and DataLad and Git Annex and Git have all the standard merge processes that allow you to merge these changes. And if you run into conflict, much like software, you'll have to resolve that conflict to make things work. Okay. Yes. So switching to between DataLab and Git Annex. I'm sure you mentioned it before, but can you repeat like why we're using both of them? Ah. So Git Annex is the layer that sits on top of Git and DataLad sits on top of Git Annex. Git Annex deals with a single Git repository. It has no concepts of multiple data sets or multiple repositories, like, just like Git. So Git has concepts like subrepo or subtree, but it doesn't have a concept of multiple. So if you have different Git repos, you'll have to go into each one individually to do Git operations. So Git Annex is like that. So, it, so DataLad doesn't want to, they've talked about this, whether to expose every single Git Annex command also at the DataLad level. Uh, and they've decided that they're, they're going to do that only for a few things. And those who want to use those Git Annex commands will just use Git Annex uh, at the repo level. Uh, they don't want to replicate functionality partly. So, uh, But if you think that that's a barrier, just post an issue. Say, it would be nice if all Git Annex commands were available via DataLad. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, this is related to the search command. So is there a kind of SQL layer to this so you can actually do queries in the data sets? So like SAS Enterprise would be able to do it? Not right now. So right now it uses a very limited form of Python linked data to do the search. Uh, they are planning on changing that framework, but that's going to rely on the metadata uh, representation. And one of the things I took away out from this notebook is how you add metadata to your own files. Uh, because they're changing that as we speak. And they said, whatever you tell them, Satra, it's going to be obsolete next week. So. Uh, we're going to wait for that, and so a future version of this will have that metadata adding. Uh, right now, it does very basic metadata based on text. Yes? No. So DataLad has nothing directly to do with neuroimaging per se. It's a general purpose software that happens to encode a lot of neuroimaging data sets because that's the domain it came out of. But as we are doing over here, creating a data set, I mean, that one, two, three file didn't, doesn't have anything to do with neuroimaging per se. So it's a general purpose thing to version your data and control it. And we'll go through a few more things to, that should hopefully build up that this is exactly like Git for data. Keshe, could you speak up a little more? Yeah, sorry. Let's f continue through this toy problem. Maybe that will get to the answer for your question. Uh, I think that's exactly the kind of thing DataLad enables one to do. Uh, and you have a question on? Uh, oh. <coughs> I'm dying a little bit, but uh, so you can put any sort of, like, just to clarify it, like, I any digital study object. Studies. Right. Absolutely. So it, again, it's a general purpose store. You can throw in any digital file, any digital blob that exists on the file system into data lab. OK, I had one. Uh, you mentioned the, the stability of the interface with the API for the metadata. Can you comment on the, the stability of data lab more generally? How mature is this? I don't want to speak for Yarek or Michael, but uh, I use it on a reasonably regular basis at this point in time. Uh, and most of it is stable. But I'm willing to live with a lot of uncertainty in a lot of things. Uh, I, I would say that it's still in an alpha stage, but it's very usable. Uh, and at this point in time, the inertia to change API gets bigger and bigger. So there's a lot of resistance to big changes in API from this point on. They, they just made a big 
push to a bunch of things. And so I expect, again, and that didn't touch much of the API. Yeah. And uh, they are still under funding. They are under a no cost extension, I think, right now. Yeah. Um, and we'll see what happens post that. Okay. Just one more thing about Git Annex. We uh, didn't have to Git Annex amid this new. Right. Because it's already a Git Annex repo. Once you say data lad install, data lad create. So that's one of the built-in. Yeah. Right. So when you call data lad create, it called git annex underneath to create a git annex repo. Okay. So we can look at this data set, um, and one of the things. Uh, let's see. So one of the things we can see is that this uh, git object, that this one two three, this modified one two three file, where we've stored three two one now, uh, has a change signature because it's got a different content. But because this is a git repo, we have both the current file and the old file inside. So it's just that the one, two, three file, the link points to the new file, but the old object is still there. And the reason for this is because you may want to go back to that state of the repository. Just like in code, you, want to go, you may want to go back to a different state of the code. This allows you to go back to a different state. So maybe this answers Keshi's question partially, which is that you may have different analysis you're conducting and you overwrite things. If you committed those analyses every time you did them, you'd be able to go back to a different state of the analysis. And that's what we're going to try and do in the next few pieces of code. Yes? Oh, so I, if you look at this line, 31 in my case, mm -hmm. uh, when I look at this data set, uh, this output thing is different. Uh, Part of this is I know it's different, but yes, if you were to actually scroll back up and look at the previous one, you'll find that it's different. <laughs> right, it's a Git repo. Okay, okay so it's just like a commit? Uh, it's in fact this next command, git log. So now you can view the history of this repo. OK, so we're going to now do a toy imaging analysis. We're going to write a script and run it and store the output and the script into this data lad repo. Okay. So I'll just walk through this. Uh, we're just changing the data set, uh, making a directory called scripts. Uh, this is a bash command to basically create a little string that we write this fabulous imaging shell script called run.sh. We change the exec permissions, and we can take a look at the script itself. So if we execute that, it just shows us the content of the script that it's been written. Now we will run this on this data set. Um, and we will add the scripts and the output back into the data set. And now let's look at git log again. So now we have a new entry which says added scripts and output. So what we can do is go back and check the state of any file or any state of this data set because this is a completely version controlled data set with both scripts and data. So you can imagine sharing a version of this data set which has your scripts and your output and your input exactly as you saw it at that stage. And that can itself be used for regression testing or other purposes as you make changes to your code or your analysis. Okay. 
So we're going to look at this data set. Now this data set, instead of just having one, two, three, has one, two, three, the out file, and the run.sh script in the script directory. Yes? So, it was like It's still there. Yeah. So every object in a data lad repo is stored in the git annex content store. Maybe that's one way of thinking about it. The actual content of those objects are in the content store. So what we could do is check it out. And this is actually an example. Uh, this is related to git. The hash, the commit hash that I have there is actually incorrect. And that's because when you commit, git actually creates the commit hash together with the timestamp of when you're do making the operation. And so what we have to do is to go back, and we will find add modified file. So we will use this commit hash ELE7945 and stick this into this piece of code because 8CDC was an operation or a commit state from a previous run that was stored in the notebook. So we'll replace this with the current commit hash and we'll run this. And so there are two sets of output that are provided here. Uh, the first one shows us the old state of the git repo with just file. And then I check out master again, and it shows me the current state of the git repo, which has the input file, the out file, and the scripts file. So that's how you can go back and forth between different states of the repo. So it's literally like a git repository for your code. All right, so I'm going to leave exercise eight for you to do offline separately. I'm happy to help out with it. The solution is there. For sake of time, I kind of want to move on to the next piece, which is NeuroDocker, uh, and play with it a little bit before we take a break. And then post-break, we'll come back and look at NiPipe. Okay. Are there any questions on DataLad and Git Annex? Yes. Well, the security concerns are the same as your file system, right? Uh, so to the extent that you are sharing data with someone or pushing data elsewhere, uh, it's either like code or like data. So we, during the AWS session, we heard about access keys <laughs> being stored accidentally with your repo. So if you have a version of your data, let's say pre skull stripping or anonymization or defacing, and then you run a defacing operation, and you push that entire repo out, then obviously that those previous blobs are going to be there. Now the one piece I didn't show is, where do you publish this to? And that's a piece that they're still working on in various ways. There is a git annex command called, uh, or plugin called git annex r clone, nothing to do with the stats package r. Uh, r stands for remote in this particular case, and it has support for, let's see. Um, So R clone is a really nice piece of software. It's R sync for cloud storage. And it has support for Google Drive, Amazon, OpenStack, Dropbox, Google Cloud Storage, et cetera. Right? So it would allow you to, and it's actually installed in this container. So you could, with your credentials, push your My Dataset repo to one of your favorite uh, cloud storage providers. But it'll be private to you still. Right? Because by default, that pointer link that's there is to your private R clone. So if it's Dropbox, it's your private Dropbox. For, some, for the data set we have been using for the workshops and other things, Chris generated fMRI prep and free surfer derivatives uh, for that data set. And he shared those files with me. We took those, we uploaded them to Dropbox, and we got a public link for every file programmatically through the Dropbox API, and then created a git annex 
repo to point to that. So access things are still going to be limited to whatever the shared access is between you and your collaborators. Uh, but they have videos now for box.com and uh, GitHub's own storage system called Git LFS. Uh, so you can follow those to at least use those pieces. The rest is a little bit still in the hacking stage. There's not an easy one line to push with public data, uh, but the scripts are available, so it wouldn't be too hard to make it that way. Uh, but security concerns are completely the same, which is you have to consider what version you push. Because it's a Git repo, you could clear out history. So you could say, I'm going to only push this latest bits of uh, my repo publicly. But yes, if you just blindly use this, then all the security concerns that are normally available with sharing data are still there. Okay. Are there any other questions on? Yes. So what I would suggest doing is if uh, with Git you can have sub repos, right? Uh, and that would actually be a nice way to do this thing. So you have your code repo separately, you have your data repo using data lad, and within data lad you create through Git a link to your code repo. So now you have two parallel things but with versioning maintained all throughout. So, that would be what I would suggest, but at the simplest level, you can mix data and code into the same repo. It's just that we often do other things in other repos where we are sharing code. and So it's as flexible as the Git world. Yeah, but to have to separate yeah. things, yeah. then the others, for example, just replace the data set. Right. And I think it partly depends on what you mean by data set, right? So if, if you think of the data set in this re-executable mode of input data, code, and output data, then it makes sense to have a version of that code in this data set. But you could achieve this through a sub-repo uh, for Git. Okay. If there are no more questions, uh, let's see, what's the time? 10.23. All right, we'll do 20 minutes of neurodockering. Okay. This notebook is not executable at all. Uh, it's the reusable, uh, the introductory environment notebook. And when I created this, which was a week back, this is already a little obsolete. So, <laughs> uh, NeuroDocker is a very rapidly changing uh, project uh, to support creating reusable environments. And the reason I say obsolete is we run into something and we abstract it out to make it simpler. It's not that you can't run the old things, it's just that the abstractions can't continuously create simpler interfaces. So what we're going to do is try it out through um, the actual I'm going to paste this link um, into the Slack channel. The general idea behind NeuroDocker is to support neuroimaging. There's enough Docker builders around for various kinds of things. But when you want to install, so let me perhaps just get a show of hands. How many people here use FSL? Okay, how many people use SPM? How many people use FreeSurfer? Okay, how do you install those things? Many, many different ways and pathways, right? Uh, how do you install various versions of it? 
how do you? Download. Separately install into a different folder? Although, some of the softwares come with updates, but for SPM, you need to separately download. Okay. So, what Nero Docker does is makes it a little more convenient to install these tools into a Docker container. At some basic level, it's a general purpose Docker container installer because it has the ability to install any packages using any of the package managers. So, if you're a CentOS user, you can use Yum. If you're a Neuro, uh, if you're a Debian user, you can or an Ubuntu user, you can use apt to install packages. Uh, it can also take in a JSON file as an input to create the packages. So in some ways, you can version how your environment is created as part of building your environment. In fact, the reason I say this keeps changing. The latest version embeds that JSON spec into the Docker container itself once it's done, so you can reuse the spec from inside your container to rebuild the container. So we're really trying to get at ways in which you can rebuild the exact environments that you're working with. So let's do a quick uh, thing. This will pull the data for, for you. Uh, we're going to, let me pull, make this bold, a little larger. We're going to run the Docker version of things. So we won't pip install Nero Docker because even if you pip install Nero Docker, it'll still require Docker. So we might as well just use the Docker version. What this will do is it'll pull the Nero Docker image from Docker Hub. It's a very small image. <laughs> So while the, that small image is downloading, which should be very, very quick, I'll copy and paste that command into the Slack channel. Um, let's take a look at all the things that NeuroDocker allows you to install. So it doesn't allow you to install everything on the planet yet. Uh, we, were, we kind of did this on a use case by use case basis as we added things. So for example, with AFNI, it allows you to install a particular version or latest. And latest is whatever Bob decides latest is whenever it's released. Uh, with ANTS, you get access to a few things, but you can also give it a git hash, for example, to compile from source. So it will do things under the hood in terms of being able to build and create your environment. Uh, and eventually, we will get to every single one of these having a git hash option that allows you to build every single software from source. Uh, so that way, you can not only be executable at the level of the version, but the actual code and the libraries that it depends on. With FreeSurfer, uh, basically say any version for which binaries are provided, which I believe is as of 4.2 onwards. Uh, not that anybody would use 4.2 ever, uh, but that's, I think, the earliest version of FreeSurfer. But for example, we also have this min option, which is what's stored in this container, which is only 800 megabytes. And it's tuned for one purpose only, run recon all. Uh, so most of the time, people don't download FreeSurfer to use all the goodies that FreeSurfer provides. The most practical use case is to download FreeSurfer and run recon all. Uh, so there is a specific version. If you set the min equal to true flag, it just downloads that bit. And that bit was created with a very nice tool, which I'll only allude to, called ReproZip. And I'll come back to it a little bit later in the context of NeuroDocker. Uh, Many of these packages in neuroimaging are created with a lot of bloat. So FreeSurfer has 730 binaries, for example, of which I think 80% belong to Bruce, uh, because that's his playground. And uh, most people don't use all of those binaries. So often you have the notion of reducing the space or the size of the package to only the things. And ReproZip allows that, and NeuroDocker has support for it. And we'll get to that in a second. Uh, Miniconda, so it uses Miniconda to install Python environments. You can install multiple Python environments and multiple packages inside there. 
Uh, MR Tricks 3, which is a diffusion software. It has support for building it either from source or uses binaries. It has explicit support for NeuroDebian, but as we will see in an example, you can create the Docker image from the NeuroDebian-based Docker image, which means that you have access to all of NeuroDebian. Uh, and it has support for SPM version 12. And it installs what's called the MATLAB com common runtime of SPM 12, which means you don't need a MATLAB license to run this. So you have access to, for those who use SPM, full SPM without MATLAB license. OK, so what we are going to do is we are going to execute this command. We won't actually build the second command. Don't r please don't run the second command. That will take a little bit of time. <laughs> but I'm assuming at this point you were able to download or pull the image and saw the help from it. So when you run that first command, it doesn't build anything. It just spits out a Docker file. No, because we are running a Docker container there, and we didn't prepare this image with something called Docker and Docker. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons we sent out that email saying, to follow along with this part, you need to have Docker on your local machine. Yeah. So, um, this SPM should be able to run without the Does that allow for other files? I'm being recorded, right? We'll talk about it later. <laughs> yes. So all, most, most of the things have some visual interface that you might want to use when you do the analysis. But as I understood from Chris yesterday, in Docker, it's not, like for example, I cannot necessarily open free view. You can, it's a bit of work. Okay. So I need to do some work if I actually want to use the full free server. Right. So if you want to use Freeview or Fossilize, uh, you'll need to do a little bit of work with Docker to make that work. It's not impossible, but it requires certain sets of settings to be in place. You can also run X2Go inside Docker, uh, and then you can connect it with X2Go. OK, so let's take a look at this file that was created. Uh, and what this is is really it's building a Docker file for you, which you can then use with Docker to build the image of the container. Uh, this was a very simple one uh, with just ants version equal to 2.2.0. Let's just quickly add, uh, let me get this. dash dash SPM version equal to 12. Oh. MATLAB version, what was the one? So what this is encoding is a set of knowledge that would have been required to install these tools in various environments. It's really a collection of recipes that it exposes through this command line interface. Uh, and that makes it much easier to install things across these packages. So we can take a quick look at this slightly uh, bigger Docker file. I'm not, you can run this on your own separately. I'm not going to ask you to uh, build this. You can run it without building it, for example. But uh, let's go through the different pieces that are there. 
So the first thing is this generate command, and that's what's generating the Docker file. Then this dash dash base points to a Docker image that you want to use as a base. So in this particular case, we are pointing to Debian stretch, but you could point to literally the hundreds of thousands of Docker images that are out there and built from any single one of them. We're using package manager app because we know that this is uh, an app-based install. And then the second line, which says install, just uses that package manager to install any of the packages that are available through the package manager. So we're installing Git and Vim in this particular case. We can then move on to some of the imaging ones. Uh, we say AFNI, ANS, FreeSurfer, FSL. Uh, and you can see how the syntax is structured to say version and any flags or options available with it. All of this is done in root space. We can switch user. So Docker containers allow creating multiple users. So you can create a user. In this case, we are creating a user called Neuro. And within the user space, we are installing the Miniconda environment. And as you can see, this, is, this allows you to use various Conda options and pip install options as part of installing these pieces. And you can have multiple environments, Miniconda environments, in there. Then we can switch over back to root and install MRTrix3. We can use NeuroDebian to install a few other packages. This is mostly just giving a flavor of all the things you can do. You would never use all of these possibilities to construct your Docker image. You would focus on a few things. Um, Use a, uh, installs SPM. It can also allow you to set uh, key value pairs, uh, so environment variables. So for example, that could be used uh, to add your free surfer license or your SS or AWS keys into the container if you wanted to. And then the run bash is only two days old uh, because we were repeating this thing called, I'll show you that instruction. Uh, We were repeating things like this all the time. Run bash minus C and do something. So the run bash basically encapsulates this thing. I mean, we're still limited by what Docker allows and doesn't allow. This is still building a Docker file. Uh, but the run bash now allows us to basically execute bash scripts inside as a single line. The add to entry point, uh, it'll create an entry point, which is what gets executed when you create a Docker container. Uh, and you can add anything. So for example, you might use an ent entry point to source your FreeSurfer environment file, which happens by default as part of the FreeSurfer installation. But that's the kind of thing that exists in the entry point, or your FSL source file. Uh, those are things that exist. Uh, you can set uh, expose a port. So for example, because we installed Jupyter, we might expose 8888 as a port that gets run when we run this container. And it generates a Docker file. And then you use the build command. So this was the generate command. And you use the build command to tag and create a container. Yes? So I can basically use my bashrc file from home and all the stuff that it's preloading that I usually use, pack that all into the image and it's going to look like my terminal. Yes. And it'll be completely reproducible in the sense that one of the things we are going to move towards, which is not quite here, is uh, in the Docker world, many people use latest uh, as the default way of downloading things. Uh, we're going to move towards versioning every single Docker image we create with either a git hash or uh, a timestamp. Uh, because to make things truly repeatable, you have to pin down to very specific versions of things. Uh, so again, building from source with git hash allows us to be very specific about the environment. But even things like Ubuntu, when you say Docker pull Ubuntu, it's pulling the latest version of Ubuntu. But you can also pull Ubuntu with a shasam. So that way, even the version of the operating system environment is fully repeated. 
Okay, the last thing I want to point to before we break is this idea of reprozip and minimizing Docker images. So this container that we're using through Jupyter Hub uh, is about a 10 gigabyte download and it expands to about 20 gigabytes, uh, which is why we didn't want people pulling that during the workshop itself. But that's a very large image, and most of the time, you're not using all components of it. Yes, if it's your personal hacking or development setup, it might be nice to have all of these things. But if you're pushing these containers to various cloud resources to run things, especially in a high-performance cluster setting, you may want to have a container that just has the pieces you need. So let's say you're running Recon All. It should just have the pieces you need to run Recon All. ReproZip is a very nice Python package uh, that allows you to trace execution of things. And it captures what dependencies any given command needs to execute that command. And it'll pack those dependencies into a ReproZip pack. What NeuroDocker can do is you can use NeuroDocker together with ReproZip to minimize these Docker images. So you can execute a set of commands inside um, a neuro Docker container and then use NeuroDocker itself to pack down that container to a minimal form. But that limits you to just the kinds of commands that you executed. So it's no longer an exploration space. It's about turning an image into an application, into a self-contained. So if you're creating a bid zap first example, instead of distributing all of FSL, if that app was just using a few components of FSL, you